Welcome to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Juliette Lamar, and joining us today is Ken Griffith. He is the CEO at Soldus, and they have a new product out called Champeza, and I'm excited to learn all about it. I'm sure I've mispronounced all of it. <laughs> welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you, Juliet. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, absolutely. And thank you for joining us. And you've got some exciting stuff going on over at Solidus. Am I saying that right? Uh, yes, Solidus or Solidus. Solidus, yes. So tell us tell us about what you guys are up to over there, and then also give us a little insight into the new product, Champeza. Uh, sure. Um, Solidus is uh, a company in Bermuda, and uh, we ended up in Bermuda because um, our chairman and his wife lived there. Uh, they're native Bermudians. And um, it's uh, the company's made up of myself, Ian Grigg, and um, Mark Bean, who is the Minister of Parliament there in Bermuda, or he used to be. He's retired now. And um, what we're building is a product called Chama Pesa, which is an app for savings groups in Africa and the developing world, and also for people in um, the first world. And um, most people have never really heard of savings groups. If you're from the United States, it used to be kind of popular back in the 80s to, to do what were called investment clubs. And this is similar. Um, in the developing world, you'll see that uh, the banks are not very reliable. They cost too much. They have a lot of inside corruption and theft. And so um, there's a low level of trust in the banks. Um, So these people will form a savings group to handle their own insurance and credit uh, and savings needs to basically to manage their cash flow. And what they'll do is they'll form a group with maybe five to 25 of their friends um, or family or it could be coworkers. And the simplest kind of group is called a merry-go-round where they just, um, let's say if you're in Kenya and and they're using shillings, they would each bring a thousand shillings a month. And if there's 10 of them, then um, at the end of the meeting, one of them will take home all the money, which is 10,000 shillings. And then the next month, the next person takes home 10,000 and they go in a rotation. So for them, it's a way of um, kind of social savings where they have the peer pressure of you've agreed to be in this group um, and you need to save this money. And if you don't save the money, you're actually hurting the other people in the group because they've already they've been paying regularly. And if mm-hmm. uh, one of the people drops out, then now there's not as much, there's not a full 10000 for them to take home when it's their turn. So um, the long-term effect is that it, it brings people together um, and it helps them to solve their cash flow needs. You'll, you actually see this with immigrants in the United States. Um, most of, I always will take a taxi or an Uber whenever I'm in uh, New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. And... Um, Consistently, I'll, I'll talk to the, the driver and I'll ask him where he's from. Usually he's an immigrant and they almost always are in one of these groups. And oftentimes that's how they bought the car. Um, so these families continue to, to do this even in the United States. So we're making an app that essentially digitizes what they're doing, um, gives them good bookkeeping and records and helps them to uh, keep track of a lot of the social aspects of the group. Absolutely. And and like you said, this is really opening a lot of doors for people, you know, say immigrants come to a different country, um, you know, they don't have the, the credit, they don't have the financial standing to be able to set down roots and actually start contributing to to the new society they live in without some sort of savings. And I, I don't think a lot of people, unless you've been through that process, understand all the the complexities of it and the difficulties involved with it. You're exactly right. In fact, if you go to Chinatown in any, uh, you know, city in California or whatever, you know, uh, an ethnic suburb, you'll find um, that most of the restaurants, like the Korean restaurant, the Chinese restaurant, uh, the Vietnamese restaurant, that those communities do use the same process of this kind of savings group. And that's how they fund their businesses. And that's how what they've been doing as immigrants for, you know, it started 
probably 150 years ago, um, but it's still done today. So we are uh, the technology that we're using is well, it's just software, and we're doing it on the phones because the people in these countries mainly access the internet with a phone, not with a computer. And uh, we came to realize that there were some certain elements that the block a blockchain could help us with. So Ian Gregg has designed a a new kind of blockchain specifically for these groups called a Ricardian light chain. And essentially it treats the group having their monthly meeting or their weekly meeting as the actual uh, the block. So when they do all their transactions uh, at their meeting, which is what they normally do, that's very easily converted into a block and then they all sign off, sign off on it. So it's a very low bandwidth um, type of chain, but if you only have if you have one per group, you don't need to be able to process uh, you know thousands of transactions per second. You may only need to trans you know uh, transact maybe um, twenty to one hundred and fifty transactions per month. And then we also connect it to um, a more traditional global blockchain on which um, we'll have some smart contracts running. And the smart one of the smart contracts that we intend to create is called a distributed Ricardian contract. And um, this will allow the creation of asset-backed tokens, um, such as a national currency or uh, gold or silver um, or other things that you can think of. So to give you an example of why we think asset-backed tokens are important and why this is revolutionary, you see a lot of people trying to do asset-backed tokens now. Um, such that Every six months or so, you'll see a new gold Bitcoin project announced. And then you've got the Tether, the USDT um, called Tether, where people need a digital dollar to trade against uh, the cryptocurrencies. Um, so for our, our savings clubs, they deal in their local currency, which starting in Kenya, it's Kenya shillings. But whatever country they're in, that's usually the currency that they use. So we need a way to digitize those national currencies. And um, using a distributed Ricardian contract, we essentially create a contract where these savings groups, which uh, many or most of them hold um, a small safe or a lockbox where they hold cash for the group, um, they can actually be the backers of the issuers of a digital shilling, provided that we have a way to keep them honest. Um, obviously, if you have 10,000 groups that are each holding you know, 100,000 or, or less uh, shillings, um, and they're issuing digital units against the, the shillings that they're holding, how do you know that they actually have them? And, mm-hmm. and so our answer to that is to require them to put up some collateral in the form of a token. And the token for our project is called Chama Coin, but you could actually do this using any, any um, cryptocurrency or token. Uh, the point is that it's something of value they have to buy and then they have to stake it or give it, basically hand it over to a smart contract. And that smart contract now will set them a issuance limit based on the value of the collateral they put up. Essentially sets a limit on how much digital shillings they can issue. So by decentralizing the asset reserve, we avoid the main problem that we've seen with centralized um, digital currency issuances like back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we saw a bunch of digital gold companies like Mm eGold. And they they were very successful. They were doing up to $2 billion a year in transactions. In fact, Bitcoin has only recently reached that level. Um, But in the end, the U.S. government shut them all down and grabbed the gold. Uh, So they, they basically went after the centralized asset reserve. Now, so the problem you have if you have a redeemable token that's redeemable for something is that somebody has to hold the stuff that the token is redeemable for and be willing to hand it over. So we see the same problem with Tether, where Tether uh, wants to be able to say, yes, we've got the dollars backing this token, but they're afraid that the, their bank will be attacked. So they're keeping the bank a secret, and that's why there was all that drama. With um, They hired a law firm to kind of do an audit uh, a few months ago. Um, so what we're doing, is says, instead of having one pile of, asset sitting in a vault or sitting in a bank account that makes a very tempting target to attackers, whether the attacker could be a thief, could be um, a government, could be a government agency that says, aha, there's some, there's a big pile of money and we have these convenient asset forfeiture laws. Let's find an excuse to indict that company and grab that, grab that value. So 
what we do instead is we distribute the the asset reserve backing the token amongst thousands or tens of thousands of savings groups so that no particular group is holding more than you know one percent of the value and it actually becomes quite expensive then for an attacker to because to attack one group there's not a, there's not a lot of um, value to take from them so that's the that's the logic behind the distributed contract well, that's fantastic and adding such a, a, another level of of protection really from from fellow members and from hackers and and all those things that are they're coming in to kind of put a bad taste in your mouth when you're when you're just trying to to create something with with your community um the the trauma ecosystem has so many different portions of it um so what are some of the features within it that are accessible to community group members the main issues we are looking to deal with are uh the issuance and trend, uh, accounting for value so that would be Chama. Some Chamas use shares. Like when you mm-hmm. save every month, you're actually buying share capital. And so the group issues shares to the members and then they invest the money. So there's accounting for shares, there's accounting for money. Um, there's also the social aspect. Um, these groups, because they're dealing with trust, when you want to join a Chama, two existing members have to guarantee you. And what they're doing is they're saying, well, we recommend this guy for a Chama or this gal. Um, and I'm willing to go be on the hook for any bad behavior that this person brings into our chama. So like if the person borrows money and then doesn't pay it back, the guarantors are on the hook to repay the loss. So they need a way of recording those guarantees. So we have a social side of the app where um, you have you basically have a profile and you're able to add people into your address book. Um, and you're able to make assurances and guarantees of other people. So an assurance is basically saying that Alice is Alice. I'm, I'm Bob. I've known Alice for 10 years. And yes, this is a valid copy of her ID or something like that. Um, whereas a guarantee would be me saying, well, I'm Bob and I'm willing to guarantee Alice for um, a thousand shillings for two years. So what I'm saying is that um, I, I'm willing to risk a thousand of my own money um, for Alice's good behavior. So if Alice mm-hmm. defaults later on a loan, then my thousand shillings could be called in. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Nassim Taleb. He is a Lebanese-American economist, and he's written a book called Skin in the Game about how um, people having their own value at risk helps keep systems honest and helps make accurate financial decisions. Um, when it's your own value that's at risk, you tend to be more careful with it. So we're basically mm-hmm. applying that principle. Uh, the Chamas already are doing this, and we're just, you know, upgrading it a little bit by digitizing. Absolutely, and and I love that you have people who are vouching for you because that is that is also the community aspect. This is not strangers who are in in these circles. It is people who know one another who are trying to build something together. That's right. So then we also have a chat um, section, and you could almost consider that to be the core of how the app functions because. The groups have to come, they normally come together. By using Chama Pesa for their group, they can actually uh, have that sh- this chat room that's kind of semi persistent. It's there all the time that they can talk uh, and can converse amongst themselves. And we, we're going to call that the palaver. Um, that comes from a, a tradition in Africa, and it may also be in South America, but it's definitely um, almost universal in Africa that every village will have a big tree. Usually it's a mango tree. Sometimes it can be a different kind. And people have meetings under this tree. And they're like, when you, whatever something happens that the community needs to talk about, people will gather under this tree and then their elder will address them or they might have more like a, a, a meeting where different people will talk. Um, but this is a tradition. So we are basically calling the chat room aspect of the app, the palaver tree. And that's where the, the meetings will be run. So um, if you're having a physical meeting and people are bringing the app, you can actually have the secretary of your group. He's, they're basically typing in what's going on um, into the, the app and it's being recorded. Or it would also allow you to do a remote meeting, potentially, if you have people in different countries that are part of a group, which often happens. Like um, I met some ladies in Kenya who had, were in law school and they, when they graduated, they formed a, a chama with um, the other ladies in their graduating class. 
because they wanted to stay in touch. And so they ended up going to different countries, and yet they still have a phone call once a month to have their Chama meeting. And um, <laughs> it's apparently somewhat common. Fantastic. Julia, Our... have, you, have you ever been in a, a situation where you and friends have worked together to on a, like a financial project to achieve something? Have I been in a project? Sorry, repeat the question. Well, I'm just kind of asking if you have ever, if you could see the usefulness of a Chama in your own life. But have you ever met anyone who's done something like this or have you participated in something like this yourself? Or do you see an area where it could be useful, could be useful to you? For me in my personal life? Um, potentially, yes. I think that this could be a new way of doing business and it could be a way that people are involving one another from, you know, all across. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be present, which is nice. So if you want to start a company with somebody who is in, say, you know, the middle of the country and then there's someone in New York and there's some, me out here in California and we're trying to bring more and more people into maybe maybe a project like a startup or something. Could this technology be used in that way to start gaining funds for people who are contributing ideas and knowledge to a project and funds? That yeah, it absolutely, could. it absolutely could. Yes. In fact, yeah, um, I, I think happening. I think we see one thing that's happening in crypto this year. Um, last year, because the value of Bitcoin went up so much, and almost all the cryptos followed it, a lot of People came into the, you know, came in as kind of uh, speculators or prospective investors or just people who wanted to be involved. But a lot of them don't know how, so they would go to their friends and family who already like. There's one guy that you know who was really into crypto, and so all of a sudden after last year, a lot of people were saying, "Hey, um, can I like give you some money and you'll buy some crypto for me?" Well, it would be very easy to start a crypto chama where mm-hmm. you just have a group of 10 people and who want to save on transaction costs. like, um, And so you pool money and once a month, you, know, you buy some crypto and you invest it according to a portfolio and you have a treasurer who holds the tracer with the, the keys. You know, that's it would work very well for that kind of thing. Absolutely. And it, it's something where each person's skill set is being used in the best way possible. So say someone has more money than time and they want to invest in for our example, in Bitcoin, but they don't know how to buy cryptocurrencies and they don't know how to, they don't want to be bothered with keeping it secure. And then someone else might have a lot of knowledge about buying, keeping it secure and whatnot. And those two people can now work simultaneously and start creating a Chama, a Chama for, for themselves and for others who might be able to contribute different skills. And I love it. I think that's the best way to succeed is to employ people who have specialty skills in, in one area, put them together, and then each person is doing what they're best at. Exactly. You're basically creating a micro fund. And then you also, if you did this in the United States, you'd have to make sure that you incorporate the group correctly. But that's, you know, that's just... In in, in Kenya, they're, they use what's called the Cooperative Societies Act so that these little chamas are considered cooperatives. All they have to do is register one little form with the government and like file one once a year saying, yeah, this is our group, we saved this much money. Um, and there, I think their KYC is you're supposed to keep a copy of the ID of everybody in the group. So there's a little bit of there's a little bit of overhead in terms of um, record keeping. But again, that's what the app is for. Um, Absolutely. In the states, I think people would use uh, they could use a limited partnership. They could use LLC. You could use a number of different ways. Pretty much the same way that investment clubs have have incorporated over the years. So if people want to to get started with Shama Pizza and they want to they want to do something in any country that they're in, what is the best way to get started? I would say uh, come to the website chamapesa.com, d h a m a p e s a.com. Just read about what we're doing, look at the white papers. Uh, we have a Telegram a Telegram group called at Chama Pesa. And that's a good way to come in and talk to other people that are uh, involved in this and see them ask questions and maybe ask your own question. Um, Project is going to be issuing this token called Chama Coin, and we're going to have a public sale a little bit later in the summer, uh, maybe toward the end of the summer. Um, Unfortunately, that's going to be closed to American residents and residents of the USA and residents of China. Um, But hopefully we would like to see the app itself released and available to U.S. Uh, residents um, once once we actually get the, the product launched. And that's probably going to be 
about 12 months after the token sale, which will be in September, uh, end of the summer type uh, time time frame. Fantastic. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us here today and for giving some insight into Chama Pesa and your company and what you're doing. It's it's such a great, a great, and it's not even like a new idea. It's just a, a new way of putting it together to protect the members. And it, it's something that is much needed and I think is really going to do well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. That is Ken Griffiths. He is the CEO at Solidus, and he has that new product we just talked about, Chama Pesa. Like you said before, check out their website at chamapesa.com. That's C-H-A-M-A-P-E-S-A dot com. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been Juliet Lamar with Future Tech Podcast. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.